three days ago, exactly at this point of time, three days ago, my family and I were in Airlie Beach in the Whit Sundays in far north Queensland. Now, I jokingly said to my kids it was more the Whit Rain Days than the Sundays because we had a lot of rain, but we had a fabulous time while we were there. We we're on a road trip up the east coast of Australia and um, we stopped at some fantastic places uh, like uh, Rainbow Beach. And that's where my daughter Adeline got stung by a blue bottle. And then we stopped somewhere at um, Harvey Bay. And that's where my son, Tobias, got attacked by a caterpillar and had a rash for quite a few days. And then we also stopped at a place called Cape Hillsborough. And if my kids are to be believed, this is where we survived a snake-infested bushwalk. I didn't understand that two snakes, two little snakes as you're walking through the bush for an hour and a half means it's snake-infested. But we had a fantastic time. Airly Beach was our turnaround point. So we got to Airly Beach, we were there for a few days and then uh, we turned around. And um, sadly, three days ago, at this time, it was time for us to pack up, it was time for us to check out and it was time for us to jump into the family minivan and begin the trip home. So, in those 72 hours since we left Airly Beach, we have travelled 1,791 kilometres. We've run over a kangaroo. I've heard way too many times some, some just let me call it disagreement in the back of the minivan between some of the kids. Such and such did this, such and such did that. We made numerous toilet stops, probably too many to count. And we went through some funny town names, a place called Billa Billa, and another one, Gundawindi. This was Cohen's favourite for the next two hours, I think, maybe longer. All he could say was, Gundawindi, Gundawindi this, Gundawindi that. So I know what's going to happen this afternoon. You'll be saying to yourself and to your family, Gundawindi. It's a fun name to say. Anyway, so that's been our last, um, our last three days in the Heinzen household. And you might be thinking, well, what does this have to do with Easter, uh, Wayne? What's it all about? Well, um, as I pondered speaking this morning... I started to think about Easter as a journey. And I started to think about the journey that Jesus went on. So it's a journey of redemption, it's a journey of restoration, it's a journey of relationship. And so what I really wanna do is I wanna travel or take us on a journey with Jesus across three days of Easter. So we're going to begin our message um, the night before, so the night of the Last Supper on Thursday evening, and we're going to go through until the night of the resurrection. Um, so we're going to sort of go either side uh, of uh, Easter um, because it's a journey that um, wasn't beautiful, like the journey that we undertook, but it was a journey um, that was much more important than anything that we did um, as a family. So my message this morning is called 72 Hours. And I want to journey through 72 hours around Easter, the night before Jesus was crucified until the night of his resurrection. Now, I'm going to say this. We do not have time to go through every single event that took place in those 72 hours. So I am going to kind of weave in and out of the Easter story. Um, what I also want to really do is I want to show you that at every moment during that journey, there is good news. The good news, if you've been in church for any length of time, we celebrate today, we celebrate Easter Sunday, we say that he is risen and that is true because the resurrection was good news. But I want to show you this morning that right through the Easter journey, there was good news. In amongst what was pretty horrific and what Jesus went through, there was continually seeds of good news that was there. 72 hours changed the course of human history. It changed the destination of mankind forever. And it was all because of the transformative power, the obedience and the sacrifice of Jesus. And so that's what I want to dig into this morning. So let's begin on Thursday evening. This is known as the Last Supper. Okay, so 72 hours begins on the night before Jesus is to be crucified. The air in Jerusalem is thick with anticipation as the Passover season begins. Jesus and his disciples are in the upper room. They're enjoying the Last Supper. The 12 who have walked with Jesus, who have talked with Jesus, who have learned from him, who have witnessed the miracles, they are all there. The fisherman, the tax collector, the doubter, even the betrayer. They are all together in the upper room. 
And it's a special time for the Jewish people because it's a rem reminder, Passover was a reminder of their deliverance from, e from Egypt. And so they're celebrating that. And in Luke 20, verses 15 and 16, here's what we read, Jesus says, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So for the disciples, this is just another celebration. It's another Passover celebration. Um, it was just something that was very, for them, steeped in Jewish tradition. And so they're celebrating it, not really understanding the gravity or the importance of this Last Supper, why this Passover was different. So it's a sacred moment of instruction and fellowship, yes, but that what the disciples don't understand and what we, with the benefit of hindsight and history, have the opportunity to know is that within the next few hours after they gather together, the weight of the world's sins will rest on Jesus' shoulders. And so it's a very special, special time. And I think Jesus is actually rewinding the clock because nine or ten days ago, what Jesus has actually told his disciples was that his crucifixion was coming. We read that in Matthew 20, 19. He says that he would be mocked, flogged with a whip and crucified. So Jesus is already foretold to his disciples. And so as they have the Last Supper, he's almost like he's saying, hey, guys, remember what I said a week and a half ago? Well, I'm going to remind you again so that you are prepared for what is to come. You are prepared for um, the crucifixion that will happen in just a matter of hours. They don't fully grasp the situation, the disciples. But even in this moment, I want to say that there is good news. And I want to show you the good news that is there. And you might be thinking, well, you know, as a man sits with his friends that he's done life with for three years and says, hey, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be flogged, I'm going to be mocked, all this is going to happen. You might be thinking, well, where is the good news? Well, I want to say this and I want you to grasp this. In God, no matter how dire a situation, there is always his goodness in amongst it. No matter how dark the night God's goodness is there. No matter how deep the valley, the goodness of God is there. Sometimes it's hard to see and sometimes we've really got to find it. We've got to search for it. We've got to want to find it. But I promise you it is there. Our family has been through some really hard seasons. But his goodness has remained with us right through that. And so that is a truth I need you to grab hold of. So these men, they're sharing communion together. Jesus breaks some bread and he says to his disciples, as we celebrated this morning with communion, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he does likewise with the cup. And this is where I want to focus in terms of the good news because it says in Luke twenty two twenty, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. The bread, his body, the wine, his blood. Where is the good news? Where is the good news? The good news is the new covenant that Jesus has just instigated. It is a new covenant for mankind and God. It is a covenant of grace. It is a covenant of forgiveness. It is a covenant of eternal life. Now, the old covenant, the law, was etched on stone, and it was a separation between man and God. And Jesus has said right now, as we celebrate this time at the, together with the Last Supper, I'm instigating a new covenant. It is a new covenant that invites us into a personal relationship with God. No longer is there a separation between man and God that has been um, removed. That's good news, isn't it? Isn't that good news? And so it is the covenant of grace. And as I thought about this, I thought, Jesus not only speaks right through scripture, but then he demonstrates. And so as he instigates the covenant of grace, he then actually displays that grace with regards to Judas. So we know that Judas is one of the 12 disciples and Judas has agreed for 30 pieces of silver to actually betray Jesus. And so he does that. But what I love is that Jesus models the covenant of grace right there at the Last Supper. Because here's what he says to the other disciples. But here at this table, sitting among us as a friend, is the man who will betray me. 
Jesus knows very well there is someone there at the table that will betray him. Jesus knows very well that it is Judas. The disciples don't because in Scripture we read that they're asking each other and they're asking Jesus, is it me, is it me? Am I the one that's going to betray you, Jesus? No, I wouldn't do that. I think Judas knows very well because he's already got his bounty. But what I love and the grace that we see is that even though Jesus knows who his betrayer is, he doesn't name Judas. As the disciples are asking, is it me, is it me? Jesus doesn't say, no, it's not you, it's him, and points to Judas. He doesn't do that. He doesn't shame Judas. He doesn't expose him. He doesn't condemn him openly. Jesus doesn't do any of that. What he does is he extends grace even to the one who he knows will hand him over to death. Isn't that just such a beautiful picture of the new covenant of grace? It is a picture of the cross. Because what did Judas deserve? Judas deserved to be punished. Judas deserved to get what was coming to him. But what did Jesus give him? Jesus gave him grace. He modeled grace in that particular moment. And I think it's just a great example that for you or for me, that no matter how much someone has offended us, no matter how much someone has hurt us, no matter what someone has done to us, we need to be able to, and it's not easy, I'm not saying it is, but we need to be able to get to a place where we can extend the same grace that Jesus showed Judas in this moment of time. We, we will receive our justice. We will. But not at our hands. It'll be God will be the one who brings justice into a situation if we've been wronged. So let him worry about that in his perfect way, in his perfect timing. That's Thursday evening. Then we head to Thursday night and the Garden of Gethsemane. So after the Last Supper, Jesus and his disciples, they retreat to the quiet of the Garden of Gethsemane. They're surrounded by ancient olive trees. And because, Judas, uh, sorry, because Jesus knows what is to come, he also knows this is a weight I cannot carry alone. And so he retreats to the quiet of the garden to spend some time with his father, to spend some time in prayer. He separates from the disciples and he has some quiet time with God. It's such just a, a beautiful picture, I think, for you and for me. When things get tough, when we feel overwhelmed, let's just go to a quiet place and spend time in our father's presence. And he will lighten the load. He will ease the burden. He will help to carry whatever we're going through. And we see what Jesus is going through because he's sitting with Peter and James and John. And here's what he says to them. My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. This is the humanity of Jesus on display. He knows what is coming. He knows what the next number of days, the next couple of days is going to bring. And so in that humanity, he is grappling with the weight of what is to come. He knows it's a moment that's been prophesied for a long time, but he also knows something else. He knows this is God's redemptive plan for mankind. He knows that this is something he has to go through in order for God's plan to be fulfilled. Yet even knowing that, he pleads with his father. He says this, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. I love the posture of complete surrender. What might you or I pray in that moment of time? I've got a feeling we might pray this. My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. That's what I think we would pray. I think we would leave the second line off. I don't think we would say, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. But that's what Jesus does, and it is repeated again. He says, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. Your will be done. God could quite easily have stopped what the events that were to come, he could have stopped that right then and there and changed the course of history. But he didn't because there was that redemptive plan for mankind. And so 
in his complete surrender, Jesus is saying, I choose not to interrupt the plan that the Father has. I choose to, to surrender to his plan because I know that it is a plan that is much bigger and greater than anything that I can do. And I think maybe for you and for me, there's a lesson in that. God's got a plan for your life. He's got a plan for my life. He's got a plan for every single person's life. Whether they accept that plan or not is up to them. It's up to you. It's up to me. The challenge, though, is in his plan for your life and mine, can we surrender to that? Can we surrender to his will, to his plans? Can we actually allow him to truly be Lord of our life? It's easy to say, but it's not easy to do. It's really easy for us to go, yes, Lord, your will be done. But what about when he asked you to do something that's seemingly outrageous? What about if he asks you to go somewhere that is completely out of your comfort zone? What about if he asks you to go and speak to someone and share the good news with someone that looks completely different than you? Maybe they look a little bit scary because they're a little bit different. What if he asks you to actually do that? What if he asks you to stand when all you want to do is run away? Do you surrender to his will? Or do you think, hmm, I got this one, God. We'll catch up next time. I know it's a challenge for many people. And I think more and more in the world we live in, it's getting harder and harder. Because we live in a world that is self-orientated. And I've been sort of you know, just dwelling on this and, and sitting on things for a little while, but there's so many self-help books available. We get told to rely on self-confidence. We get told that um, we need to be self-reliant. We don't rely on anyone else. We rely on ourselves. That's the world that we live in. Yet that goes so opposed to what the gospel says because the gospel says to lay down our lives and surrender to the will of the Father. It's opposing the culture, the world that we actually live in. Living the Christian life is not about self. Living the Christian life is about others. And I didn't have time to go into it. One of the things that I love is at the Last Supper, knowing that he's going to be crucified the next morning, Jesus lowers himself and washes the disciples' feet. That is a beautiful picture of serving others, not self. The Christian life is about surrendering to God's plan for us, even if, as we see in Jesus, it means laying down your life so that God's plan can continue. Because Jesus knew that in that moment of time, something much bigger than himself was about to happen. Jesus submitted to the Father's will so that the greatest act of love ever displayed could be seen by you and me. And years and years later, we can continue to be celebrating this act of love. Jesus and his obedience paved the way for the redemption of mankind once and for all. Imagine if he said no to the Father. Imagine if he said, I don't like that plan. I'm going to do something else. Where would you and I be today? We'd be in a mess. That's where we'd be. And I think this is why when Judas arrives with some soldiers, there's no resistance from Jesus. He doesn't put up a fight. He just surrenders to them, knowing this had to happen for the plan to continue. All right, so let's go to early on Friday morning. And this is where we have the mock trials that take place. The sun is rising on a new day, and Jesus actually finds himself at the house of the high priest. And in the distance, he hears some chatter taking place. And it's chatter between the leading priests and the elders and the teachers of religious law. And they're actually talking about Jesus. They're talking about his situation. They're talking about this um, supposed alleged troublemaker. And we read a bit about this in Mark 14. It says, The leading priests in the entire high council were trying to find evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they couldn't find any. This is what Jesus wakes up to hear on Friday morning some scheming from the religious leaders in terms of how they're going to put him to death. 
but they can't find any evidence. Do you know why? Because there is no evidence. There is no evidence there. And so what actually happens is the high priest, they rise to their feet, and this is where we start to see the greatest injustice ever, the greatest injustice in, ever taken place in history. Because the high priest says to Jesus, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? And Jesus says, I am. I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest didn't like this response. He's probably an <laughs> understating it. Two words, as Jesus said, I am, was enough for the high priest to get revved up. And so he says, well, he tears his clothing, showing his horror, and he says, why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they all cried. He deserves to die. He deserves to die. Did he deserve to die? Did he deserve to die? No, he didn't. But I do think there's a valuable lesson for you and for me in how Jesus responds. Because I've got to tell you, if that was me and I was falsely accused, I was falsely found guilty, I was told that I deserved to die, my righteous anger would come to the top. And I would want to defend myself. And I would want to shout down the lies that the religious leaders are saying at this point of time. But Jesus does none of that. He doesn't do any of that at all. He simply responds with the truth. He simply says, I am. He doesn't expand on that. He doesn't say anything else. He just says, I am. He confirms what the religious leaders has said. Now, for you and I as followers of Jesus, we will be accused of something at some point of time that is not true. If it hasn't happened yet, well done for getting this far in your journey. It will happen because we are in a spiritual battle. We are fighting an enemy who wants to steal and, want to steal and kill and destroy you and me and the church and the glory of God. And so accusation and false accusation will come against us. And in that unfairness of the situation, we can want to defend ourselves. We can want to speak truth. We can want to right the injustice. We can want to clear our name. We can want to prove the other person wrong. Can I just say today, don't do that. Don't do any of that. Your flesh will be screaming at you. That's what you want to do, I promise. But I want you to listen to your spirit in that moment. Listen to the spirit of God that dwells inside you. And maybe use Jesus as your example in how you respond to those false accusations. He didn't raise his voice. He didn't shake his fist. He didn't berate the high priest and the religious leaders. He didn't dismiss the false testimony. He oh so calmly spoke the truth. And that is what we need to do. No matter the situation, we just need to speak the truth. And I think for Jesus, he knew that no matter what he said, the outcome wasn't going to change. No matter what he said, the religious leaders of the day would find him guilty and sentence him ultimately to death. But Jesus knew something, and this is the good news for you and for me. And we find it in John 8.32. You shall know the truth, and it is the truth that shall set you free. You know what is true doesn't matter what anyone else says against you. You know what is true. God knows what is true. And that truth will set you free. It may be a journey to get there. Friday morning. It is the morning of the crucifixion. This isn't good news for Jesus. The next number of hours, he'll be subjected to ridicule and abuse at the hands of the religious leaders and the Roman guards. It says this, 
Then some of them began to spit at him, and they blindfolded him, and they beat him with their fists. Prophesy to us, they jeered, and the guards slapped him as they took him away. It's even more graphic in Matthew's account. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head, and they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and struck him on the head with it. It's pretty graphic. And I find it really hard to read. Every time I read this, I find it really, really hard to read. But I think it's very, very important that we never diminish the price that Jesus paid for you and for me. And yes, it's hard to read that. It's hard to create that mental picture that it brings in terms of what Jesus went through. And if you've heard an Easter message and you've been in church for 20 or 30 or 50 years, it's easy to become a little bit desensitised to the Easter journey, to, for, to what Jesus actually went through, and to diminish or to, to water down the sacrifice that he made. But I want to remind you of something, that for Jesus, the road to Calvary was a journey of pain, it was a journey of humiliation, and it was a journey of abandonment. That's what he did for you. He went through all of that for you. That was his journey to the cross. The sinless lamb of God, a man innocent of all the accusations that were thrown at him, suffering for you and for me. And sadly, the worst is still to come for him. So the same soldiers that mocked him, that taunted him, they lead Jesus away to be crucified. He's bloodied and no doubt in immense pain. Now he's actually forced to carry his own cross. So not, it's not enough what he's gone through. Now the soldiers say, you need to carry your cross to Golgotha or Calvary, his place of crucifixion. It's outside the city walls of Jerusalem. And you might be thinking, well, where's the good news in that? Where's the good news so far in the crucifixion? Well, I want to point something out to you that is found in Matthew 27. It says, along the way, as Jesus is carrying his cross, they came across a man named Simon who was from Cyrene, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. The good news is this. No matter what you're going through, no matter how hard the journey you are on at the moment, God has placed a Simon in your path. He has placed someone in your path that will help you to carry your figurative cross, whatever that is, whatever burden it is that you're carrying at the moment. Someone to lift you up when you're feeling down. Someone to encourage you just to take the next step and the next step and the next step. That is the good news that we find in this part of the Easter story. There is always a Simon in your path. So around nine o'clock in the morning, Mark 15 tells us that less than a day after the Last Supper, Jesus is nailed to a cross alongside two other criminals. At that point in time, he once again is ridiculed by both random people who are just walking past, shouting out their opinion of events that are taking place, ridiculing Jesus, but also at that point by the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross so we can see it and believe him. He is ridiculed because at this point of time, what Jesus has said does not appear to line up with events that are taking place. But I love that once again, remember that new covenant of grace that we spoke about the night before at the Last Supper. Once again, Jesus has the opportunity to show grace towards those that are mocking him. And he offers prayers for them because here's what he said. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. 
Forgive these people that are walking past and mocking me. Forgive these religious leaders that have falsely accused me and sentenced me to be here on this cross. Forgive them. Can we pray a forgive them prayer for those that have done likewise to us? That's a challenge, isn't it? Because sometimes we just want to beat them up, you know. But that is what Jesus is modelling here. It's that covenant of grace. Can we forgive the actions of the people but still love them? Because that's what Jesus is doing. He's forgiving their actions but he is continuing to love them and it's out of that love that he is actually praying for them. He is praying to his father saying, forgive them. And sometimes, maybe just sometimes, people who have done things to us, they too don't know what they are doing. Maybe they've done something without really knowing why. And maybe they're deserving of your forgiveness or my forgiveness. Midday on Friday, Three hours after he has been on the cross, the land goes dark. For three hours, there is nothing but darkness across the land. Jesus hangs upon the cross, bearing the weight of humanity's sin and shame. And then in his final moments, he says, it is finished. It is finished. He is declaring the completion of God's plan of redemption. The plan of redemption is finished. It is finished. The fulfillment of God's prophetic plan for thousands of years, the new covenant that Jesus spoke about just the night before at the Last Supper has now begun. The old covenant, it is finished. It is finished. And as Jesus takes his last breath, the earth trembles and I think the heavens weep at the sight of their creator there on the cross, bloodied and in agony, in death. And Matthew 27, 51 says this, at that moment the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, the earth shook, rocks split apart. Now if you don't understand the curtain and the power of that, I want to very quickly explain that to you. So the curtain was basically um, an item that separated man from God. Under the old covenant, if you wanted to commune with God, you had to do that through a high priest. He is the one that would go into the temple and would go behind the curtain and speak with God. But as the curtain was torn in two, that separation between man and creator disappeared. It disappeared. Now... Under this new covenant that Jesus promised, we have a direct path to communion with our creator. No longer do we need to go through a high priest. No longer is there a separation between man and God. And I'm going to show you at the end of this 72-hour Easter journey how that applies to you and to me. Friday afternoon. I don't want to spend too much time on Friday afternoon, but I want to say this. The burial took place according to Jewish custom. And there was a man named Joseph who went to Pilate. He said, can I take down Jesus' body and can I prepare him for burial? And Pilate said yes. And Joseph, along with Nicodemus, they were both followers of Jesus. They took his body down from the cross. They wrapped it in linen cloth and they placed it in the tomb. And a stone was placed on the front of the tomb. There's a lot more when it comes to that, but I don't want to spend too much time there. Saturday, Jewish tradition, Saturday was the Sabbath. So not much happened on Saturday. At least nothing too much is recorded in Scripture. The body of Jesus is resting in the tomb according to those Jewish customs and the requirements of the Sabbath. But I think about the followers of Jesus the day after his crucifixion. And I ponder, what are they doing? What are they thinking? What are they feeling? And I can just imagine that they're still in shock. They're mourning the loss of their friend, their saviour, their hope. They're mourning his loss. They're trying to make sense of everything that Jesus said and how it doesn't line up with what 
what has taken place and where they are on this particular Saturday. They're halfway through the 72 hours and they're thinking, I don't understand what's going on. And then I imagine some of those who are actually present at the crucifixion, those that actually experienced midday turning to complete darkness, midday turning to night, complete darkness, the trembling of the earthquake, and maybe they're just contemplating their life like the centurion and the Roman soldiers. It says this, the Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. They said, this man truly was the son of God. I wonder what this Roman officer and the soldiers who had that revelation at the crucifixion of Jesus, what are they thinking on the Saturday? Even in death, Jesus is still impacting lives. Even in death, the truth of who he was is still impacting Roman officers and soldiers. One thing we do know that happened on the Saturday was that those who had much earlier accused Jesus of working on the Sabbath, of healing on the Sabbath, actually are doing the same thing. They're actually working on the Sabbath. The same thing they accused of Jesus, they now find themselves doing. And we read that in Matthew 27, verse 62. The next day on the Sabbath, the leading priests and the Pharisees went to see Pilate. So the Pharisees, the leading priests, the religious men of the day are not observing the Sabbath. Instead, they go to Pilate to try and um, convince him that they put soldiers at the entrance to the tomb because they're worried that someone's going to steal the body of Jesus and then Jesus' followers are going to say, look, you know how he said in three days, well, look, he's not here. And so there's the hypocrisy of the religious leaders right there. And I know Amy touched on this last week, but those with a religious spirit will have one set of rules for them and one set of rules for you. Be careful of the religious spirit, even in the church. Often, not always, but often, they're not living under the new covenant that Jesus died to give us. They're stuck in the old covenant of the law. And so they're trying to force us to stick under the old covenant. Right, Sunday morning, the resurrection. Now, of course, this is good news. How could it not be good news? A man who was dead rose again and came back to life. It's very easy to see the good news of the events of Sunday morning. So if you're not familiar with the story, as dawn breaks on the third day, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, as the Bible tells us, they go to visit the tomb. There's another earthquake. An angel comes down. He descends from heaven, rolls away the stone that is sealing the tomb. And then the soldiers that were there guarding the tomb, they're freaked out by what's actually happened, that they actually faint. The Bible tells us that they faint. And then the stone is rolled away. And the angels tell the two Marys, you're not going to find Jesus here. He's not here. He's not in the tomb. They say he isn't here. He has risen from the dead just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. And so they do. They go into the tomb and they only find the cloth that is there. The body of Jesus is not there anymore. And so a short time later, Mary is actually crying, she's distressed, and then Jesus appears to her, and he comforts her, and he says, it's okay, what I said was going to happen has happened, I have risen, I have defeated death. But he then commissions her to go and tell the disciples that he has risen. Jesus also appears to other women who are on their way to tell the disciples. He appears to the two disciples who are on the road to Emmaus. There is this constant um, appearing, the reappearing of Jesus following his crucifixion. And that's obviously good news to followers of Jesus. It's good news to you, it's good news to me. But for them, they're able to see Jesus again. They're able to talk to him again. They're able to um, do life with him again. The good news of the resurrection is the fact that it's the fulfillment of God's promise of redemption. 
It is the fulfillment. It's a triumph over sin. It's a triumph over death. It's a triumph over the powers of darkness. And it's the beginning of new life. And that is why on Easter Sunday we celebrate the resurrection. That is the good news that is there. And when Jesus spoke those words, it is finished, there is so much that was wrapped up in those words. The old covenant of the law, it is finished. The power of the enemy, it is finished. The sting of death, it is finished because in him you and I can have eternal life as Jesus becomes our Lord and our Saviour. The resurrection of Jesus is a great reminder that his victory over sin and death is the ultimate good news. It is the reason that we celebrate who he is. It is a gospel that transforms lives. It brings hope to the world. Our world is filled with fear and uncertainty and despair. But in the resurrection, we have a message of hope. We have a message of redemption and we have a message of eternal life in Jesus. And that is good news. That is reason for celebration, not just one day of the year, but every day of the year, every moment. All right. Sunday evening gets us to the end of our 72-hour Easter journey. And it's here that we find the disciples gathered again for a meal. Just as our Easter journey started with the Last Supper on Thursday evening, so it is, it finishes on Sunday evening with what I'm going to call the First Supper. The disciples are gathered together, but this time it's under very different circumstances. The Bible tells us that they're actually hiding from the Jewish leaders. Their concern is that they will be discovered to be followers of Jesus and suffer the same fate as him. And so they gather together in this time of fellowship. But I love this. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. You can imagine their reaction. Surely it's mixed. Surely they're like, yes. And they're like, oh, what's going on? And the Bible tells us that um, they actually thought it was a ghost. And so Jesus calms them. He says, peace be with you, to calm them, to remind them, this is me. We hung out for years together. We did life together. We did ministry together. You know me and I know you. It's all okay. Peace be with you. And then he actually repeats it again. Um, in a couple of verses later, he says, peace be with you. But then I think we see something that is integral to the growth of the church. It's integral to the future of Christianity and it's the fulfillment of prophecy. Because in verse 22, here's what we read. Then Jesus breathed on them, that's the disciples, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Remember before when I said, the veil or the curtain was the separation between God and man. And as Jesus said, it was finished as that tore into that separation disappeared. Now Jesus says to the disciples, and this is beginning of the, the church as you and I know it, he says to the disciples, here is the Spirit of God and it's going to dwell inside you. And it is that same Spirit that dwells inside you and it dwells inside me. It is good news for those 11. It is good news for you and for me. It is good news for the church today in 2024 because that is the dunamis power of God. That is the, his power, his spirit that is flowing through us that allows us to declare victory over situations. It allows us to perform miracles. It allows us to display signs and wonders because it is the power of God that is flowing through us and it all began there right in the 72nd hour. As Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit. So as we finish today, I want to encourage you that no matter what you're going through, there is good news. There is good news. Throughout our time together, what we've actually seen is that despite some very brutal circumstances that we see in Jesus, despite those brutal circumstances, there was still good news 
at every step along the Easter journey. It maybe wasn't apparent from the outset, and maybe you had to look beyond the circumstance, but the good news was there. The journey that began with Jesus' suffering and death now leads to everlasting life for all who believe in him.